I got to be honest. There was a there was a point in time. I'm on Central Time. If if for all those who are listening, and, and you're on East Coast time, it was around like ten thirty last night, and every fiber of my being was done watching the Giants and Daniel Jones and how pathetic that was. And I kept saying to myself, don't do it. Don't turn it off. Just fight through it because you've craved football for so long. Like three weeks ago, you would have murdered a man for a bad Daniel Jones getting blown out by the Giants. If you by the Cowboys, you told me three weeks ago, I can let you watch the fourth quarter of a, a 40 to nothing blowout game uh, that you've never seen before. It's like a yeah, sneak freak. I would have been like, here's $300. Let me watch it. <laughs> and so I kept telling myself that it's like as badly as I wanted to just vomit and say goodbye to why I bet the giants uh, money line upset and, uh, and how absolutely dreadful they looked. I fought through and I just want everyone to know here that's the kind of dedication we bring to the football lounge. That's right. That's right. I love it. I love it. That, that's what we do for for our listeners <laughs> and our loyal viewers. I really wanted you to sure. respond with. I really wanted you to respond. With, oh, I checked out like after like five minutes of the first quarter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No. 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 I, uh, I I did indeed watch uh, the the entirety of that game. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it was so bad. <laughs> it, was, it was so it bad. Was bad. It was. I was hoping for game. Trey Lance. Yeah, yeah, right. Let, let's get some some Trey Lance action in there. But no, yeah. instead Cooper Rush enters the equation oh, for sure. Yeah, we'll get to those games, brutal. Uh, especially that one in, in just a moment. But for sure, we're we're not treated to the the greatest quality <laughs> of games pretty much all throughout that day, Mark. So maybe it was that bad. Is what it was bad. Maybe that's what made it a little more palatable for me late at night to keep watching because I was like, oh, well, this is just what I've been watching all day. So let's just continue. <laughs> let's just continue and end the murderous run here of, of yeah. terrible uh, football games to end week one. But yeah, you know, a lot of, a lot of very interesting action to get to here in our week one recap. Looking forward to getting this underway. The first of many to come here on the football lounge, but we'll start it off with our week one recap. <laughs> All right, let's just get this one over with. Uh, this is going to be a special four-minute edition of the Football Lounge with Mark and Dan for all of you because uh, we are we are very, very sad individuals, both of our teams. Completely so embarrassed uh, in week one, but we'll get to those games uh, shortly here. If you are just now joining us, well, welcome. We're happy you're here. Uh, this is our first installment of our weekly recap series where we will provide a uh, full uh, preview um, uh, for, for the week ahead, rather, uh, but then also just a, a complete review uh, of all of the games that we just got done watching over the weekend. Of course, Monday Night Football uh, is not a part of that equation, but we'll provide a little bit of a, a preview of MNF coming up to end the show. But yeah, be sure to check us out every week. We will be bringing you uh, these great, uh, you know, re recaps and analysis uh, throughout the entire season and then of course the uh, the off season as well and check out our other shows on the four frequency sake podcast network you can go to four fantasy sake qc.com to check out all of the different shows but this here is our week one look at here on the football lounge looking forward to it mark we'll start with thursday night football uh before we get into the regular sunday action as per usual and, uh, well, we were treated to a rather good game, although a much more low-scoring affair than we thought to open yeah. up the 2023 NFL season. The Lions beating the Chiefs by a mere one point, 21-20. to 20. Felt like a much bigger victory there for the Lions. Uh, but really, the story of this game was uh, all over social media and has been for several days now with memes galore of Kadarius Toney having three key drops in this game and the Chiefs 0 for 7 on third down in the second half kind of summed up the day for them overall no travis kelsey no chris jones and it kind of showed there on the field and the lions just took advantage mark yeah the what you just ended with was exactly what happened on thursday night i talked about it on my show on saturday it is the perfect example of a better team uh giving a really good team a solid team 
a crack in the door and the Lions absolutely took that crack and the door and put their foot through and stole a victory. I mean, the Lions are a very good football team. I don't know if the Lions are a Super Bowl caliber football team. I know the Chiefs are because of Patrick Mahomes and their pedigree and their head coach. Um, and when they are healthy with, with Travis Kelsey and when they have one of the top three defensive players in the league in, in Chris Jones, they are electric. I, I think what you'll see, what we saw on Thursday night was setting up for the weekend of like, there were going to be opportunities that happen, right? Every once in a while, the better team that's at home, for some reason, whether it's an injury or in this case, an injury and a contract holdout, they were vulnerable and the Lions smelled that blood and they took advantage. And the Lions didn't even play their best game. It took then... Um, a solid game from the Lions with less mistakes to take advantage of a of a already, you know, door opening, crack open because no Kelsey, no Jones, and then some really bad miscues from a from a Chiefs team, mainly Kadarius Tony, uh, that leads to a Lions victory. Shout out to the Lions. They deserve credit for stealing that game in Kansas City. I think the Chiefs will be absolutely fine. But if I were the Kansas City Chiefs, the biggest bummer of the weekend was Mike Evans having a nice day and the Tampa Bay Bucks winning because I was all in on, and I still think I, I would, if I were the Chiefs general manager and I was at the front office of the Chiefs, I would be making phone calls. I'd be trying to figure out who's available, who's unhappy, who can I bring in because after one week, I've seen enough beyond Kelsey. They're not good enough to, they're good enough to win a Super Bowl if Travis Kelsey is playing in the Super Bowl and he's healthy and he's playing. Without him, they are a team that could absolutely be upset in the AFC playoffs with with uh, weapons beyond Kelsey. It was brutal. Yeah, I mean, they need a, a go-to wide receiver on this team, and they have for a couple years, and it's kind of amazing that they've been able to win Super Bowls despite that. That's just how good Patrick Mahomes is. But when you have a receiving core of Sky Moore, who barely saw any targets throughout this game, he was supposed to potentially be the number one yeah. uh, to taking that next step forward. Kadarius Tony, we talked about three major drops in this game, only one catch. Uh, and then it's just really a cast of characters. Marquez Valdez Scantling was a kind of, you know, a trick shot uh, type of receiver. And, um, and and then after that, it, it's just, you know, Rishi Rice, a, a rookie. And you know, there's really not much there. I was surprised as well that the Kansas City Chiefs didn't lean into the run a little bit more when, especially when they showed that they were willing to just roll out a complete trio of running backs in this game. I was expecting. Yep more of it to be the Isaiah Pacheco show with a sprinkle of Jarek McKinnon or a CEH, but it seemed to be a much closer split in snaps. And yet they didn't really lean into the run at all in this game when they really could have used it when you're down Travis Kelsey, your number one go-to target, and when it's a close game like it was. So a couple questionable uh, decisions there by the Kansas City Chiefs, but overall I'm not going to question Andy Reid and company. They're perfectly fine. This yeah. the Lions – making a statement early on this season that we are on the upswing. We're, we're, we're expecting to win these ball games going in against good opponents. And this is why both of us took the Lions to win this division this year, uh, because they do, do have this capability to go toe to toe. Yeah. With offenses in the league. Before we get into our Sunday uh, sections here, uh, we're going to pause for a quick moment. We've got a new sponsor aboard Ryan Allison, uh, a tattoo artist in the quad cities. So we'll pause for a quick word from that. Transform your body into a canvas of exquisite storytelling and profound self-expression with the skilled hands of Ryan Allison. Craft custom masterpieces that tell your unique story together. Ryan specializes in color tattoos as well as black and gray. He also practices a diverse range of styles. Whether you're passionate about anime, fantasy, mythology, pop culture, video games, movies, the esoteric, nature, creatures, dot work, black work, or you have your own ideas, Ryan embraces your distinct vision with an unwavering commitment to passion, precision, and originality. Each project... You All right, well, whoops, I, I think I cut it short there, but check out Ryan Allison for sure. You can also check out uh, any of that information at 4 uh, com, But we will move on to the Sunday slate here, and we'll begin things off, Mark, with the Panthers... At the Falcons, Atlanta winning 24 to 10 in this ball game. It was the Bijan Robinson and Tyler Algier show there. Yeah. Dominant rushing attack 
for the Atlanta Falcons. And our first, you know, real look as with, with Desmond Ritter kind of, uh, you know, obviously it's not his first start, but the first iteration of this era and uh, Desmond Ritter getting the opening start here for the first time, 15 of 18 for a touchdown, no interceptions, like very efficient performance. And that's kind of the way I think we anticipate these Atlanta Falcons being able to win games and how they're going to play. It's going to be physical, uh, close ball games, uh, but they're going to try and control the clock and, and, and move forward with that. On the flip side, we obviously saw the uh, NFL debut of the number one overall pick, Bryce Young, and kind of a mixed bag, but really not so great overall. The, the yeah. Panthers struggled all around offensively, not much of a rhythm, didn't get the ground game going at all. And we kind of saw their lack of, you know, talent or explosiveness on the outside. So all in all, it was kind of a, a a perfect recipe for Atlanta to take advantage of a team very much in the rookie learning phase, while Atlanta kind of had that blueprint and foundation set to run the football. And they they plugged in one of the best rushing prospects of all time just right into that. And it worked out very well. So Bijan Robinson, Tyler Algier, I'm sure, are happy, as is Arthur Smith. Falcons starting off with a two-touchdown victory over their NFC South rival in the Panthers. Yeah, I, I mean, I will say this. When you look at the, the game plan overall and then you look at the box score, it just didn't feel like Carolina was really clear in what they wanted to do versus Atlanta that felt like they had a plan and they stuck to that plan. And... I, the last thing I think many Panthers fans would have wanted to hear, and I'm going to say this a couple more times on this show, is that, wow, your young quarterback comes out and throws the ball 38 times on the road against a veteran Atlanta defense. Um, Miles Sanders, 18 carries. Chuba Hubbard, 9 carries. At this point, I think like I would have loved to have seen that lower down to like, maybe throw the ball 30 times, a little less than 30 times protect him behind that bad offensive line. It just led to a disjointed offensive effort from Carolina and um, tough playing in Atlanta, Atlanta. I still don't buy them. I still don't believe in them. I know a lot of people are still going to be high in Atlanta uh, to make the playoffs, but if they can keep a game plan like this, which is really solid, efficient, take the game out of Desmond Ritter's hands, then they do have a lot of talent. I mean, Drake London didn't even show up in this game and uh, he's a special, special player. So nice win for Atlanta in proving me wrong. But I still am not buying all into Atlanta, that's for sure. I am interested also to see how this running back split works the rest of the year because everyone came in assuming that Bijan Robinson was going to get 85 90% of the carries here. But Tyler oh. Algier out-carried him. And uh, the guy was just off of a 1,000-yard rushing season in his rookie year. Yeah. So. I think people kind of move that pendulum a little bit too far. If they have two very talented running backs in the backfield and have these, the, the scheme in the offensive line that they do, yeah, uh, they're just going to be a, a team where you're going to have to bring your A game every week to be able to control them because they can have those 10 play drives, 15 play drives and, and really kind of crush some momentums of various teams. So if that continues to develop, you're, you're right. Like Atlanta, uh, while I'm not high on them overall, they could be that team that maybe surprises some people in a terrible division. I, it's not out of the question that they could make a run at this division. Both rookie running backs, first rounders we saw Thursday night, and then this game we just talked about. And I think both teams' game plan is with them, hey, these are weapons. They're not bell yeah. cow running backs. This isn't Derrick Henry. This isn't Adrian Peterson. These are weapons. So let's use them like, the Niners use Christian McCaffrey as weapons. Let's just get the ball in their hands different ways, but also protect them a little bit because running backs get beat up running between the tackles. If you have the Tyler Algiers, the David Montgomery's of the world, let them do that dirty work and let your weapons get out in space and make moves, which you saw both the Lions and the Falcons do. So again, solid game plan from the Falcons. I give them credit for that. But overall, was I impressed? I not, I wasn't a buyer in on the Panthers and they were at home so nice win. They they obviously uh, should have won that game. They did win that game, so kudos to them. I'm curious your thoughts before we move on here to the next games. Uh, I assume, as is the case with me, that none of the predictions changed at all. Uh, we, we just got done with all of our season predictions, our playoff um, predictions, all of our divisions. I mean, 
did one week move the needle at all for you? And we can get into the details later, but I'm just curious because for me, I am staying pat with everything. I, I feel like this is a typical week one where unexpected things happened and some teams look, looked worse than they will be and some teams looked better than they will be. Absolutely. I mean, I think I heard the stats somewhere today, like four teams that started 0-1 last year made the playoffs. Like it, it obviously, it happens. And um, I, I will say, I tweeted out, and I know our, our uh, Football Lounge podcast retweeted it. Um, I was doing a little crowdsourcing. I had last night, I couldn't go to sleep. My head was just racing with football takes. And something I'll, I'll talk about when we get to each game is I think there are three teams, though, that are in real trouble. And the three and the three teams, when we get to them, I'll just give you a little bit of a preview as we keep going on. They are teams that I predicted to just miss the playoffs. So they were teams that I didn't think would be playoff teams anyways. But after seeing uh, their performance week one, it's like, oh, man, they could be in more trouble than I thought. And I'll explain that a little bit when we get to them. And then there are three teams, again, we haven't gotten any of these yet, that Boy, oh boy, they really need to have a great week two. They don't necessarily have to win week two, but they need a great, great week two for PR, for vibes. And those are all three teams that I picked pick, predicted to make the playoffs, but really need a, a, a bounce back. So a we'll boost. get to those as we go. Yeah, for sure. All right. Well, that brings us to Cleveland then. The Bengals putting up just three points with Joe Burrow in his first action for all three season. Uh, against the Browns, uh, who put up 24 points, so a 24 to three victory for Cleveland in this one. I, definitely not something that most people expected going into the year. The Bengals just 142 total yards this whole game. Burrow 82 yards passing. Yeah. The Browns on the flip side had 35 minutes in time of possession, 21 first downs, and the big key to this victory for them: 206 yards rushing in this game. It was a ground Huge. attack for sure. And then they were able to to get some efficiency from Deshaun Watson there in, in, in this first game. Not not pretty really by either team, but if you look at it overall, the Browns have to feel so, so happy and optimistic about their performance here at home to open things up against, you know, a high flying Bengals offense. And is this a part of the preseason thing where Burrow didn't get any reps really at all? He was dealing with that injury, coming back, trying to get a spark, and it just doesn't happen uh, in week one. Uh, perhaps that's the case, but still to be able to hold him, Jamar Chase, T. Higgins, all of them uh, to just three points. Huge win for the Browns defense. Yeah. And then encouraging to see the offense uh, be able to score and, and, and rush the way they did. Yeah, I mean, the Browns defense, why can't I think of the of the guy's name who just became their defensive coordinator that hired him in the offseason, um, used to be the head coach. You got me uh, too. I'll look that up right now. He just used to be the head coach, uh, not Schwartz, um, Jim Schwartz. Oh, I believe Jim Schwartz? It, yeah, you, you former head coach. He had that defense ready to go. Miles Garrett looked unblockable. Like, I mean, already like... It is Jim Schwartz, yeah. Maybe favorite for defensive player of the year after week one. And I, I'll just say this. Two things. Bengals not worried about it yet. Burrow was awful in week one last year. He was awful in week one the year before. He's never had good week ones because he's just never had healthy training camp. So I'm not worried about that yet. Yeah. The weather was bad. For some reason, it the Bengals can beat up on the Steelers and the Ravens in division with the Joe Burrow era, but they can't beat the Browns. There's Sometimes there's just teams that have a mental edge. We'll get to that when we talk about it, my Bears and, and the Packers. I think that's just part of it. It's just the way the world works sometimes. Um, but I'll say this. Best thing I saw all day out of, out of this game was 40 carries uh, overall for the Cleveland yeah. Browns. That is a commitment. And Stefanski is smart. Lean on it. Now it sucks that they're going to lose their left, or their right tackle. Why can't they get the guy's name? He's out ACL, MCL um, for yeah, the Cleveland. Jonah Williams. Jonah Williams, uh, right? Was it Williams or was it? Um, look it up real quick. They just announced that news right before we started recording. Um, but they that, they lean on what they're doing. Oh, good yeah, at. yeah. Jack, Con Jack Conklin. Conklin, yeah. And, yeah, and, yeah. and so, Deshaun, yeah. here's the thing about Brutal. Cleveland. Cleveland is very similar to teams like San Francisco, teams like Miami, where they're, where they're loaded. They really are loaded rosters. But the thing that Cleveland has is they have a quarterback who we have seen in the past be extraordinarily dynamic. Now, he wasn't great in this game, 
But if Cleveland can play football like that and then have Deshaun Watson make one or two of the plays when you need him to, um, I may have been wrong by picking Cleveland to be fourth. They were one team that really, um, this could be more than just a week one type of thing. This was a really nice performance by them. Not worried about the Bengals. Really impressed with the Browns week one. Yeah, I agree overall. And it is just that week one thing with Joe Burrow for sure. I mean, just hasn't had many preseason. I remember last year they got trounced by the Steelers in week one. Mika Fitzpatrick had that. He threw five picks coming off of that uh, appendectomy. Yeah, yeah. So it's just... It's it's a brutal start, but once Joe Burrow gets going, he's he's off and running, and yeah, it, not worried. It won't take more than a week, so yeah, they're going to be perfectly fine. But the Browns are uh, certainly getting themselves in a in a good position to start the year. Let's go to the Jaguars taking on a divisional opponent in the AFC South. Uh, Thirty-one to twenty-one victory for Jacksonville over the Colts in a game where uh, it was pretty competitive throughout. I think we this this was one of the better games to watch. Uh, certainly was some sloppy play. There were five total fumbles in this game, but overall yeah. uh, was pretty fun to watch throughout because there was uh, never a sure uh, ending to this thing. But uh, Travis Etienne gets a nice 26-yard touchdown run. Looked really good on that. It was uh, right after the interception. That yeah. sealed the win for Jacksonville late in the fourth quarter there. Uh, but really the storyline was Trevor Lawrence looked really polished and, and, and good in most of this game. On the flip side, we had you know, Anthony Richardson making his NFL debut at quarterback. And, you know, between the three rookie quarterbacks and Bryce Young, CJ Stroud and Anthony Richardson, Richardson looked by far the best in my view. And and he was playing against a really good opponent and a pretty yeah. solid defense in Jacksonville, 24, 37, 223 yards passing one touchdown, one pick and Richardson added 40 yards rushing and a touchdown on the ground. So pretty good performance overall by him. They got the offense involved. You have to wonder what this would have looked like with Jonathan Taylor on the field. But, of course, he is out for the first four weeks on the physically unable to perform list. Overall, Jacksonville gets a double-digit win. You got to hand it to them. But I also am impressed with what we saw from the Colts. And, you know, Anthony Richardson so far uh, looking pretty good. He did take a couple shots. That one yeah. late near the goal line was a little concerning. So you just hope that that this isn't going to, you know, forecast uh, some beatings down the road here because they're going to want this guy healthy if they want to be competitive. But kind of a win-win for both teams, really. Yeah, I mean, besides Anthony Richardson, their running backs carried the ball for less than 26 total yards yeah, on 15, 16 carries. I mean, that is brutal. And the fact that Anthony Richardson, again, 37 pass attempts. I just said it with Bryce Young. That number is just too high for these young players. Like they're, you're just asking them to do way too much. And I, I'm just a firm believer in if the game is starting to get out of hand. We'll talk about it with your guy, Kenny Pickett coming on up at what point in time you just say, let's just get back to running our offense. Like forget the score go. Like I get it. You're down big and you want to compete. We'll compete by just running your offense and, and helping your guys out. And I know some of the worst things you could do then is do a go three and out. I'm not saying run three yards in a cloud of dust, just run the ball three times in a row. But sure. by by drop, going in a shotgun and just whipping the ball around the field, it, it sometimes I just think it's so it's such a detriment to these young quarterbacks and these teams overall. Um, yeah, that's all I'd have to say about that. Otherwise, he he was very impressive, Richardson. Jags, they did this is such a take care of business win, and it's weird saying that about the Jags. But this is why I felt good about the Jags getting to that, you know, 12, 13, 14 win mark this year. It's wins like this. You came in there. You had no idea what to expect from the Colts. They were feisty. They hung around. And on the road, you just took care of business. You have star players in ETN. Uh, Trevor Lawrence looked great. Calvin Ridley was unguardable. Yeah, and that's exact, exactly what you want to see. I mean, look at Calvin Ridley, eight receptions, 101 yards, a touchdown. Zay Jones, uh, five catches, uh, 55 yards, a touchdown. Evan Ingram, five catches for 50 yards. ETN, five catches out of the backfield as well. Christian Kirk, their number one guy last year, one catch, nine yards. This yeah. team is vastly improved weapon-wise, and uh, this is why people are high in Jacksonville and should be high in Jacksonville. They took care of business on the road against a divisional opponent who they had no idea what to expect from them. So great win for them. Indy, I think they're going to be feistier than we think. 
protect your young investment. Run the damn ball. Take the ball out of his hands a little bit. Yeah, late in the game, uh, yeah, I would be in his ear saying, hey, we're not trying to run and, and dive over the goal line in these situations. I get it. It was still a competitive game at that point, and you want you want your guys to, to try well, and, and win the ball game. But find a different way to scheme up these things. I totally agree with that. That's what pisses me off as a fan, and I would be pissed off if I was the Colts because – Late in the game, I want to. If you're if you're in the game and you can win, then yes, go all out, throw the ball, do what you have to do, put your body in the line. You want to win games. It's this. It's the shit earlier in the game where it's like, why is why are we design running so much okay. early in the game, taking those hits, letting them add up? Why is he throwing it so much early in the game when it's the game's on the line? Yeah, all the playbook should be wide open, and I want my guy to win. It's that early in the game stuff. It's like, why? What are we doing here? Um, that are it, it can to me drive me crazy when you're trying to you know build something when you're not in competition for a Super Bowl here. It's not week 17. You're trying to make the playoffs. You're just trying to build something and start this kid's career. Absolutely. I mean, and to your point about Jacksonville, I think it's on the nose. I mean, they have so many weapons now. You you look at Christian Kirk being the big free agent acquisition uh, to begin the season last year for this team, and he was the number one. And they, they didn't even need him to be on the field or produce much in this game. They were able to get that production from Calvin Ridley, Ingram, yep. Jones, elsewhere, ETN. Like They just have so many different ways they can uh, spread the ball around. Yep. And when you have a, a very star-capable quarterback in Trevor Lawrence, that's going to make it very difficult for any defense to attack. So great win for the Jaguars and uh, encouraging stuff from the Colts there as well. The Bucks go on the road at the Vikings in Huge. the dome and take care of business in the – Baker Mayfield, Tampa Bay era that uh, got launched this week. Bucks win 20 to 17. And Baker Mayfield, two touchdowns, no interceptions in this game. Very yeah, he looked good. Efficient performance from Baker. Kind of the classic Baker, too, where not do too much. Be simple. You don't need to, to pad the stat sheet with yards. Um, just get, get the throws that are necessary. They didn't even run the ball terribly effectively in this game either. Uh, so it was really about Baker being efficient, not turning the ball over, and the Vikings doing the opposite. Three turnovers for the Vikings, none for the Bucs. That was kind of the, the the big note for this game, in my view. And I talked about this preseason, Mark, which is why I wasn't high on Minnesota. One-score games last year, they won eleven. They went 11-1 and one in one-score games. They are 0-1 to begin this year. It's going to reverse back. Yeah. There's never going to – you're not going to have that much luck in one score games and they already start off 0-1 against a bad Tampa Bay team a, a team that I still feel confident in saying is bad what what do you think uh, was the takeaway for this one was it more about Tampa like do you feel a little bit more confident about them or do you just feel like the Vikings are who we thought they were no my or takeaway both. my takeaway is this is um we're, we've run in now one of my first of my six teams I want to talk about uh the Vikings are a team that needs a bounce back after this like they so they're one of my three teams that I said that is in this list of I predicted them to make the playoffs. I still have faith in them to do that, but this was bad. Like, this was bad. You need to win this game. You're a better football team than, than Tampa. You're at home. Two fumbles from Kirk Cousins and the interception. Three turnovers from your quarterback is bad. I don't mind Kirk throwing the ball 44 times. I really don't. What I mind, though, is you get rid of Dalvin Cook and then Alexander Mattinson rushes for 11 carries, 34 yards, and Ty Chandler, three carries, no yards. Like, you you got rid of Dalvin Cook, and now you have no running game, like, in week one. Like, that is a concern. Kirk throwing the ball 44 times, he's a professional quarterback. He is very good at putting the ball up, usually safe with the ball. So I don't mind that. It's not like we talked about with Anthony Richardson or Bryce Young. Uh, the other concern is Justin Jefferson's body language afterwards to the loss. Not great. He didn't get the extension. I know there was talks about him getting extension. He, someone needs to get in the kid's ear uh, uh, in his family or his his posse. The kid got twelve targets, nine catches, one hundred fifty yards. Go eat. You're on the beginnings to a Hall of Fame career right now. There's no need to force your way into a bad situation or greener pastures or anything like that. You're eating right now. You are on your way to a Hall of Fame career, record setting career. So just stay healthy. Yeah, you want to win games, right? Uh, Jordan Addison looked not, looked good. Kirk hit him for the big, long 39-yard uh, touchdown. 
Um, overall, I'm not panicking if I'm the Vikings, but they are firmly in one of my three teams that needs to bounce back in week week two. They are a week two is a, a, a must win for the Minnesota Vikings to kind of help right this wrong because you're exactly right. The narrative all offseason was the one score games and they come out and lose a one score game. That's bad. And for Tampa, really quickly, again, I, I, I'm i not going to think much of Tampa. This is definitely one of those. No one believes in us. Everyone's got us on the, you know, on the back. Certainly Minnesota seemed like they took them lightly and they came out and they still some really good veteran players and they played pretty well. I think Tampa's ceiling still extremely low. And I still think Tampa's best served selling off pieces. Like Mike Evans can play still go sell him off, get a first round pick for Mike Evans. You know what I mean? And go into the tank, but I still think that's the best course of action for Tampa, but who knows? Maybe they'll surprise us. I- I'm still nowhere near buying that yet though. Yeah, not buying them. Uh, it, it, speaking to the Vikings for next week, they travel to Philadelphia. I know. In week two. So good luck, Minnesota, because you're you're staring down 0-2 pretty pretty heavily. And once you get in that rut, uh, it's going to be difficult to, to crawl yourself out of that. Certainly not going 13-4, and four, most likely at that point, and repeating no. from last season. All right, let's go to the Titans at the Saints. Another really, really close game. The yeah. Saints pull out the one point victory, 16 to 15. Uh, Derek Carr, in his debut in a Saints uniform, throws for 305, a touchdown, a pick in the win. Ryan Tannehill on this offense, though, for Tennessee looked brutal. Bad. Three interceptions, a completion percentage below 50 for Ryan Tannehill. I don't know what they're going to do. I mean, Will Levis was inactive for this game. Uh, they, they had Malik Willis as the only backup quarterback. It, it, you know, like I said, I I think midseason we very well could see them turning to a backup and and trying to get yeah. something going. This was a terrible debut for the Tennessee Titans. The only solace that maybe they could take in this is that you played a really good defense. The Saints are a very good defense, solid team, and you still kept it close. It was a one point game at the end. Uh, so usually, if you lose the turnover battle that badly, it's going to be ugly. You lost by one. So, you know, maybe they can grind it out. But this is going to be that type of year for the Titans. I don't think anything's going to come easy for Tennessee this season. That's just what it seems like for me. Yeah. Meanwhile, for the Saints, hey, I mean, it's not encouraging, but you got to win. And that's all that matters. So you take that and, and you move with it and try and try and improve. Yeah, I wouldn't panic if I was New Orleans. This is exactly what you think New Orleans is going to look like all year long. And if they can win their home games and – stay competitive in their division. I mean, listen, the Titans are no scoff at. They have a very solid defense. Derrick Henry had a lovely, a really nice day. I mean, he's still such a yards monster. 15 carries, 63 yards, but it was able to break the big 46-yard reception as well. Um, I think they should be, if you're a Saints fan, you should be very pumped about this win. First thing with Derrick Carr, he found Chris Olave over 100, 100 yards for Chris Olave. Um, Michael Thomas actually played and made it through the game healthy. That's Rashid a positive. Zahid had a really good game. You know, you don't, so. you don't yet have um, Alvin Kamara, who's going to be your yak guy and just a monster for for Derek Carr. So I'd be pumped to find them. And if I was Tennessee, obviously Tannehill's a huge concern. I wouldn't bail on Tannehill just yet, but again, they're they're in a tough spot. They need to bounce back in a big way. They're not one of my three teams that need to bounce back because. I think my expectations for the Titans were still just lower than have them necessarily yeah. in the playoffs. And I don't think they're in real trouble because I think their division is still really workable for them to go two and zero against the, the Colts and the Texans. So, you know, bad showing, try to burn that tape. If you're Tannehill though, uh, Tannehill really needs to bounce back because his job is, is on the line. This Titans team has talent and they, they can win games, but, they can't win games with him throwing three interceptions. Yeah, I mean, we could be staring down the final starting season for Ryan Tannehill. And Absolutely. And do a two, three-year back up and out of the league at that point. I mean, he's 35 years old, I believe, so he's getting up there for sure and um, going to need to start turning in some better performances here, especially with the, you know, DeAndre Hopkins coming on board. Really excited for him. I think he got, what, 60 yeah. yards, so not nothing crazy, but yeah, you expected a little bit more because they added to this offense. and uh, Totally. Uh, Probably brighter days on the horizon for Tennessee. All right, let's let's uh, let's get this one over with. Uh, the 49ers absolutely thwart 
my Pittsburgh Steelers, an embarrassing showcase from Pittsburgh all around. Uh, the only bright spot was TJ Watt getting three sacks and a couple forced fumbles. Uh, everything else was horrendous, awful, terrible. Uh, San Fran looked really good, very efficient. Brock Purdy impressed with how good he looked coming off, of, you know, six months removed from that elbow surgery. And uh, he, it didn't seem to be impairing him at all. So no. the Kyle Shanahan system is working really well with Brock Purdy and just overall with this team. I mean, we knew coming into the season that roster wise, they are set. I mean, they are, you know, top three roster in the NFL. The question mark was always, what are we going to get out of the quarterback position? I thought this was super impressive from San Fran because Brock Purdy did this against the Steelers defense, like a top five defense in the league. He At carved him up coming into this and he carved him up. Uh, you know, Christian McCaffrey ran the football really well. They bullied the Steelers defensive line, which is, you know, by my estimation, a top five uh, defensive front in the, in the league, just based on, you know, the Cam Haywards, TJ Watt, Alex Highsmith, uh, and, and, and plenty of other guys to, to rotate in their big bodies. Uh, and they bullied them. This was bully ball from the 49ers on both sides. And so that's, you know, that's certainly encouraging for them to know that they are picking up this year kind of where they left off last year. And so uh, everything seemed to be clicking. And they didn't need Debo or Kittle to dominate. It was Brandon Ayuk in this game and Christian McCaffrey that took the load. So they have the ability to go to a lot of different guys if need be. Look, I mean, there's nothing really for me to provide that's going to be any sort of enlightening take on this game. It was really, really bad. It, extremely discouraging as a Steelers fan to see them come out this flat after how, you know, we, we know that the preseason isn't any indicator other than we want guys to feel comfortable. And it seemed yeah. like the Steelers offense was really comfortable in the preseason with how they run their offense. Pick it. And, and company, five drives, five touchdowns. They seemed in sync. Uh, they were anything but in this game. Kenny was all over the place. He seemed very antsy. Like yeah. his feet were all over. Uh, mechanics were were not sound. And uh, just, just were rushed. And they didn't run the football at all. I mean, they abandoned it very early and just said, oh, we'll just take the L here and we're going to have to just try and force it through the air. A lot of problems with how they approached this game, but – you know, I've seen a lot of talk about Matt Canada. I, I mean, I dislike his offense as much as the next person. It's terrible, and it's been bad. This was not on him. There were a lot of open receivers in this game. Kenny was just not seeing the field well, and he wasn't making good decisions. A um, couple unfortunate throws as well. You know, Deontay slips, and that's the first pick of the game. But overall, the the, the accuracy needs to improve. The, the offense needs to find a rhythm. And they need to assert their will because that was embarrassing at both lines. They were getting beat up. It was just a good old-fashioned ass-kicking. So that's really all I have to say about that. And it doesn't help that Patrick Peterson was talking the whole week before saying how the, the 49ers have tells and he'll let you know when he gets his interception on Sunday. Well, Pat, you talked and you didn't do shit. You actually got beat for two touchdowns. So maybe Purdy called him out too. Purdy called him out yeah. in the press conference. He did as um, he should, as he should. So yeah, that's, not, that's the take there. Really impressed by the 49ers. Uh I it's not over for the Steelers, though. I'm not gonna yeah. I'm not gonna throw everything up. I'm not gonna say that. This was the best team probably in the in the NFC and one of the best in the league. So brighter days are on the horizon for Pittsburgh, too, but they need to they need to turn it around quick for me to, to start feeling some confidence here. Well, and that's just it. That's why the Steelers are the second of my Team, three teams that need a bounce back because this was a confidence killing loss. And you, this yeah. is the type of loss that then leads to two or three losses. If you don't get your mind right now, they have Mike Tomlin. So I believe in his ability to make sure they right wrongs. But I mean, I, I get what you're saying about blaming more on Pickett than Canada, but it's a coach's job to make sure he understands how his players are reacting. And Kenny was not seeing the field. Well, Kenny was feeling the pressure from this very good Niners defense. And Najee Harris had six carries for 31 yards. And that's a deceiving stat because his one of the carries went for 24. So he really had five carries for seven yards and then one carry for 24. And 
I'm sorry, but on the opposite side, then you had a, a 49ers team that fed Christian McCaffrey, leaned on him 22 carries, 152 yards, obviously had the big, long 65-yard run for the touchdown. But um, look what the Steelers did with their second-year quarterback, 46 pass attempts. Brock Purdy, second-year quarterback, 29 pass attempts. The offensive-minded head coach had a game plan to settle his young quarterback and his talented roster. The defensive-minded head coach let his offensive coordinator go, putting the pressure on, they got to win this game, and it got out of hand, and it turned into a sack fest, five, sack five times, um, just nothing going, and it's the type of loss that, like I said, if they don't shake it really quickly, could could absolutely snowball into multiple losses. That's what worries me for your Steelers. Now, again, I didn't pick the Steelers to make the playoffs, but I thought the Steelers would be really competitive in this game because I thought the Niners would be a team that wouldn't be as good as they as everyone was hyping them up to be. And I look like I'm about to eat some major crow on that one because the Niners looked like they came out playing angry. They punched the Steelers, the steel curtain in the mouth on the road, impressive, impressive win for them. Nice to see that TJ Watt got off to a good start. He is a freak, and um, the Pittsburgh Steelers need to commit to running the ball, a little more play action, get Kenny comfortable, and then let Kenny pick people apart when he's comfortable and seeing the field. Yeah, yeah, they, they need to find any sort of rhythm and consistency. Uh, they didn't get their first first down until the two minute warning in the yeah. first half. I mean, that's, you, you can't do much. And, and this is the the last thing I'll say on this. And it, and it coincides with the bears game that we'll talk about uh, a little bit coming up too. the, the fact that, okay. Uh, George Pickens ended up with seven targets. That's good. But like four of those came in complete garbage time yeah. at the end of the game. Why are we, why are you not feeding and, and manufacturing targets for your best you know, weapon. It, it doesn't it's make bad sense game plan. Me. I blame Canada. Yeah. I, I, I seriously, I love the South Park song. I think it works so perfectly. If I was a Steelers fan, I'd come in with that Oscar nominated song blaring, take renegade out and just play blame Canada, blame Canada. And I would just blare it. And I, no, Mike Tomlin's see, a loyal. The thing is, I, he's I a agree. loyal I mean, guy. Canada, Canada had a, it was not a good game plan. They needed to adjust, but I just think, there were there were parts to be attacked, and they just weren't you take it. Kenny no. just didn't take the open receiver. A lot Six of carries for Najee Harris. Yes, that's bad. And, that part's bad. And like, like I need, get it. It's twenty. To, it's twenty to seven at the half. That's that's a two score game. Like people that just gave up, just gave up. And even when it gets to twenty seven seven, like it's the third quarter. Don't just that that should never just mean go into th five wide and get in a shotgun. I I 100%. you saw way too much of that from teams and it was and it led to blowouts. It did. It did absolutely. All right, moving on to the Cardinals at the Commanders. Uh the Commanders with a 4-point victory, 20 to 16 yeah. over Arizona. Josh Dobbs getting the start there for Arizona. No touchdowns, no picks. Was efficient though in this game throwing the football, but it didn't matter because the commanders had their number in the end, but all around pretty rough game. I'd say from both teams. I mean, neither offense yeah. looked particularly good. It was no. quite sloppy. A couple fumbles. Nine the commander's defense sacks. looked good though. The commander's defense did look good. They had five of the nine sacks, I believe. Uh, what it boiled down to was really Washington was two for five in the red zone, which isn't very good, but they at least converted two. Arizona was over two. Yeah. So, uh, you know, if you can't capitalize on any red zone trips, you're you're shooting yourself in the foot. Not any major takeaways because I didn't feel great about Howell in this one. Um, no, and I and I didn't feel great about either offense. But the Commanders, nonetheless, uh, eke out a, a you know a, a tight win, and uh, they start the season one and zero. The Cardinals, kind of who we thought they were uh, at this stage. No, I think I think mean, both fan bases should be very happy today. They are exactly where they wanted to be. Sam Howell played solid, um, and there's room for improvement, but you saw moments. He was a little more mobile than I remembered the Sam Howell at UNC being, 
And and so I think there was absolute win-win for both franchises. Cardinals didn't completely lay an egg. Commanders at home, new era, good vibes, getting a getting a victory with their new ownership. And their second year quarterback looked like, all right, this is absolutely worth it. This is exactly why we didn't go out and get a quarterback. We wanted to see what this kid had for a season. He's going to get the season to show that he deserves to be the starting quarterback. And he off to a, a, a solid start for sure. Absolutely. Nothing more to add there. Uh, the Texans go on the road and drop one to the Ravens in the uh, C.J. Stroud NFL debut. Ravens win 25-9. to nine. Stroud, you, you talked about it, Mark. 44 pass attempts in this game. Uh, no touchdowns, no interceptions. So he did protect the ball, um, but no touchdowns for Lamar through the air or on the ground either. It was a weird no. game. Overall. Weird game. We thought we expected to see kind of the, the Ravens offense kind of come out explosive with Todd Munkin, the air raid, uh, bringing that to this offense. It was anything but the, the Ravens really turned to the ground game when they got in the red zone. Uh, unfortunately for them, the injury bug continues to plague oh Baltimore. God. You have to wonder. I mean, they fired J.K.'s their crazy career is over. Coach. J.K.'s uh, yeah, J- career is over. And that, that sucks. It, J.K. Dobbins out for the season yet again with a torn Achilles. That's three years in a row just going down with season-ending injuries. Mar- my, meanwhile, Marcus Williams, a big shoulder injury. Yeah. Ronnie Stanley goes down. Tyler Linderbaum goes down. And Marlon Humphrey gets hurt, too. A, a slew of injuries for Baltimore. But they pull out the 25 to 9 win. It was a mixed bag from the rookie CJ Stroud. I'm curious what your thoughts were on his performance, given that he didn't turn it over, but he didn't yeah. really do anything else to inspire uh, you know, drives against this vaunted Ravens defense. They asked him to do way too much. It was just bad. Again, really horrendous coaching. Coaching malpractice. There's a lot of coaching malpractice. You have Damian Pierce. I don't understand. Yeah, <laughs> who was like, a very nice player last year. Only around. 11 carries. And again, Who cares if you're down? Who cares? You're not trying to win the Super Bowl this year. You're trying to build a freaking identity. Like, create an identity and then go with that. And I'm about to go on the same rant here in a second when we talk about the Chicago Bears, so I'll try to save a little bit of it. But, yeah, you can't ask him to throw 44 times. That is coaching malpractice on the road. Horrendous, horrendous. Um, and then for the Ravens, this is one of those things where I'm like, this will we we'll look back at the Ravens if they make the playoffs as a wild card team or winning their division is a really nice win for them in the sense that no Mark Andrews, similar to how the um the the Chiefs had did was without their star tight end, and their star tight end very much with both teams sets the rest of their offense, right? Because the Ravens, even though they've added the wide receiver position, they've really upgraded, and Zay Flowers looked really good, and OJ, Odell made a couple nice catches, is that it's still very much an offense that's designed and built around that tight end and opening everything else up. So, again, sucks for the Ravens, the injury bug. It's absolutely brutal. That's going to really pay uh, the price. But they get a victory and they get one without their star tight end to start the year. Um, so I feel good about the Ravens minus the injury bug and coaching malpractice from the Houston Texans. Just, the, it, all three of the rookie quarterback head coaches made terrible decisions. I think Matt Canada had a terrible game plan as well um, or or terrible reaction to the game getting out of hand. And we'll talk about the Chicago Bears and, 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 and Brian Dable later. I think it was well really piss poor coaching efforts offensively um, when the, the tides turn against you. Yeah. I mean, and to your point the, this was similar to the Chiefs' situation coming into the game. What did the Ravens do that the chiefs did? And they leaned more into their run game, even they though did. it didn't, didn't work out terribly well, but it worked out well enough for them. And they were able to punch it over the goal line a few times. Uh, while the Chiefs, you know, still try to do everything through the air. Yes, they have Patrick Mahomes. Um, but look, the, the Ravens were able to get this win without Lamar scoring through the air or on the ground. So they pivoted and it worked out. They get the win. You can't uh, can't complain too much with that. All right, Mark, let's get to uh, the other struggling game that we're going to we're going to have to somehow pull through. All right. Packers 
Packers beat the Bears at Soldier Field 38 to 20. I'll set the stage here and toss it to you for your full thoughts. Uh, Jordan Love, his first time uh, starting the season as the starter for the Green Bay Packers. And the Green Bay Packers had their first opening or their third opening day starter in the last 30 years. That's incredible. Favre, Rodgers, now Love throws three touchdown passes in this game. And the Packers were mistake-free, no turnovers for them. Meanwhile, Justin Fields was sacked four times. Team was disorganized, not much rhythm. I actually saw a lot of parallels to the Steelers and, and the Bears in terms of the they expectation were. that we wanted from this offense and what we ended up getting. Bears had two turnovers, one and two in the red zone. Packers were three for three in the red zone. And it's just it, it was a total mistake across the board, Mark. I'll toss it to you with this and whether or not you want to take it from here and run with it, or you want to mention it at the end, go for it. But I mentioned George Pickens only getting seven targets and those, you know, four of those coming at the end. Yeah. DJ Moore, two targets, two targets, two targets on the game. What is going on? So I, I can start there for sure. And I, and I think, again, it goes to the game planning. Justin Fields throwing the ball 37 times is too much. Justin Fields, um, having the same amount of carries as you're running back at nine total carries and leading the team in rushing is not, a, again, it's too much. Justin Fields running last year that made him a thousand yard rusher was running for his life and things breaking down and being, and just being a freak. He still has that in him. There's no need to scheme that into the game plan. There's just no need. There's no need to scheme that into the game plan. What you need to scheme into the game plan is getting the ball into your best player's hands. And what you need to scheme into the game plan is shots. Pew, pew, pew. Like, there was none of that. It was just everything was along the line of scrimmage. And the Packers' defense is, ver is fast sideline to sideline. I think the Bears had advantages with Mooney and Moore and Scott over the top. And with Claypool... High pointing balls. There was no fade so to Claypool. There was no give him a 20 yard along the sideline and just let him be taller than the guy he's, he's going against. There was none of that. Absolutely none of that. It was a horrendous, horrendous game plan. The first half, you think to yourself, okay, they played it safe. They're feeling it out. They're only down by a score going into halftime, 10 to 6. This is, and then Justin Fields deserves blame for the fumble and the interception. Two turnovers killed the momentum in the second half. The game got out of hand. Kudos to the Packers for taking advantage of it. What sucks is the truth behind Barstool Big Cat's tweet midway through the third quarter, which was if, if, if Aaron Rodgers was the quarterback, it would be like 50 to nothing right now. Like Jordan Love was not electric. Jordan Love was a solid, he played a solid game. It was, he reminded me so much of Dak Prescott. I really think Jordan Love is the next Dak Prescott. He is I going to drive us all yeah. crazy over the next five years being like, is he like the 10th best guy? Is he like the 15th best guy? Which is fine if you're the Packers because clearly they, they continue to build solid teams and maybe that's all you need because LaFleur is of that Kyle Shanahan style and he's of that coaching tree where they're just going to design the run and, and, and play football that way. Justin Fields should not be throwing the ball 37 times. And for the love of God, he should be throwing the ball downfield. It's what he does well. He's not that accurate, right? But what he's good at is he's good at making explosive plays. And he's good at then when a play breaks down, picking up a first down with his legs. Stop with the design runs. What did the Bears do really well last year after that when they, we Monday night when they turned everything around? Dan, they led the league in rushing. They had a freaking identity. Remember, we talked for weeks on this show about, man, do I just love that the Bears have an identity. So what? They're losing games. They're building an identity. They come out week one with no identity. They weren't going to dominate you rushing the ball, even though their O-line is better, so why aren't they rushing the ball more? And then their identity in the passing game was a bunch of dink and dunk stuff below the line of scrimmage and beneath the yard to gain. And it was just, just puke puke design football and i part of me is happy that they lost in this way because losing in this way hopefully jars them the way they lost when then they jarred going into monday night football with the packers because it's the same coaching staff so hopefully they wake up and they go 
all right, f- fuck me. We were wrong. Like, let's go back to what we did really, really well last year, which was pound the rock, which was let Justin be explosive and let's take shots. Like, just go back to that because that was an identity. This was no identity. It was pathetic. And I will say this. And again, the Bears are my third team that needs a bounce back. And luckily, Tampa won. And then they're going home. I think the Bears will beat Tampa on the road next week. I really do. I think it's perfectly set up. A, a better football team, the Bears, and the, than the Tampa. They had a huge letdown. Tampa had a huge emotional win on the road. It, the, flip, the script will flip. It, it's set up for this. If the Bears take it seriously and they have a good week of practice, is that they they – absolutely need to bounce back in that way next week. Packers, they need to just play football like this all season long. Protect the football, no turnovers, lean on Aaron Jones, um, get Christian Watson back, and let your quarterback be efficient. Because because Love was, was not great, but he took what the defense gave him, took wide open, and their offensive line was terrific. One sack for nine yards. I mean, he, he had all day to throw back there. And I'll I'll end with the, this, and and this is my one challenge to the Bears. You have a defensive head coach who has a handpicked defensive staff, who has a a management group and a and a general manager who went out and spent a ton of money getting him the defense that he wanted and the players they wanted. Edmonds Edwards invested in that defense, used high draft picks on that defense, and you gave up 31 points at home to Jordan Love. Mm -hmm. Like, that's a bad, bad showing. And Matt Eberflus seems like a really good dude. But you had the worst record in the league last year. Your team has invested heavily. You are a better football team. You are. It's your job now to build the culture and to win games, and at least for your side of the ball, to look damn good. Exactly. And it, it looked horrible. So that's my I challenge. The Eber, side of the ball. I, I'm not giving up on Justin Fields, but I am I am 100% ready and willing to give up on Matt Eberflus if my defensive head coach and his and his defense that has a lot of star players and a good players on it now keeps playing football like that. Yeah, that is a rough, rough showing for sure. They, they will need that turnaround. The warning has been issued. That, yeah, but... Get that trajectory going in the right location. All right, we got five games left here. We can rifle through these ones pretty quick. Uh, the Raiders get a uh, a one win victory at the Broncos, seventeen to sixteen. Sean Payton in his first game as head coach of Denver started with an onside kick and looked like they recovered it, but no, it, it did Classic go to the Raiders. Uh, this game, Mark, was a constant moving the ball and then stalling. For mainly Denver, but also for the yeah. Raiders as well. I mean, both offenses, uh, you know, got rhythm and then they were stopped. They were stopped in their tracks and then had to settle for either field goals or just outside and had to punt. Jimmy G looked efficient though in this. Really system, good. So it looks like it looks like it very well could work there in Las Vegas with the uh, the Jimmy G uh, era. His, it, you know, he, he seems to be healthy and, and doing well. Russ was overall mixed bag, but he looked a lot better overall than he did last season. So it was weird because both offenses did look good. They just couldn't finish at the end of games. And that's why we had this low scoring 17, 16 ball game, Um, but 10 penalties for each team. And that will kind of do it. That's going to stall things. 20 total penalties, uh, rough overall. Uh, But really, I think the Broncos are going to be fine here. I think maybe, maybe it's possible. You know, I, uh, I overestimated how poor the Raiders will be. Uh, I had them winning five games. So, yeah, me um, too. You know, I do feel a little less confident about that. But at the same time, I still don't think they're a very good team overall. Here's what I'll say this offense for the Raiders looked very reminiscent of the late Patriots Tom Brady years. I mean, Jimmy was efficient, it was needle, dink and dunk. It was hand the ball off 19 carries for Josh Jacobs. Um, and, and Jacoby Myers had a really nice game. Adams, nice game Uh, on the other side, the Denver Broncos are the first team of the three teams. I think are in real trouble. And I'll say this and why I believe they're in real trouble is it really hit me last night when that game was wrapping up. You are paying Russell Wilson now $50 million and it gets more expensive over the next two years of this contract. And 
Oh, and Russell, while he looked better than last year, he did not look like the $50 million Russell Wilson that was worth like two and a half years ago, right? Like, sure. so that is a huge concern. It's a real concern. Like the Broncos, I did not think we're going to make the playoffs, but I did think they'd beat the Raiders at home. And they couldn't do that. And one of the reasons why they couldn't do that is because their $50 million quarterback, he looked like what you'd want to pay your seventh round uh, quarterback, Brock Purdy. Like, you know what I mean? Like he looked like Brock Purdy, which isn't bad. But when you have $50 million tied up in him, that's bad. That's really bad. Really bad. And so that is a concern for the Broncos early in the year because this division is tough. And if the Raiders are better than we think, that's tough. Yeah, it's, a, yeah, it's a very difficult for sure. And Sean Payton is not a guy that's patient. I mean, no. he's going he's gonna to want to turn this thing around very quickly. He's going to want to see results or, you know, he'll do something drastic. I, I truly believe that. So, yeah, they're going to they, – they are, I agree, a, a team that, uh, you know, does – I no one has to signal alarm bells, but some teams need to – need to start thinking about how they're going to kick it into gear before Absolutely. things do get out of hand. Because, yeah, it is only one game, but there's also only 17 total. So uh, they matter. They matter for sure. All right, Eagles go on the road at the Patriots, win 25-20 to 20 in a uh, kind of a slugfest type of deal. But Mac Jones, yeah. 54 pass attempts in this one. Why do we – we have like a theme going on with week one here. Um, it's but, but, pathetic. But he did overall look good. I mean, he threw for 300 yards, three touchdowns. He had the pick. And it was a pick six, so that hurt for sure. Made it ten nothing Eagles, and that's probably what kind of it, it didn't seal the win, obviously because it was early. But that's what set them back to where you know they only lost by five. Yeah. Um, you know, Philly just the more opportunistic team here, but the, the Patriots kind of what we said if they were going to be like the best fourth place team in their division, uh, in their respective divisions, just because yeah, you know they are a tough out, they're a tough team, they play well at the lines. Uh, overall, I thought. Okay, Bill O'Brien's offense, like, d definitely looking like they run a lot better than any Matt Patricia one. But, yeah, 54 attempts for Mac Judge. You can't, just can't have that. I mean, you have Ramondre Stevenson. Like, people needed to run the ball more this week, and people just weren't doing it. The teams that did run well and, and committed, one they game. They blew teams the Falcons, out. They blew the teams out. You know, yeah, absolutely. The, even the even the Lions at the end of the game when they needed first downs just ran the ball. Yep. Like I mean, they, you so Absolutely. I agree. I, I don't think I'm not taking too much from this one. If I'm both teams, I'm bummed if I'm New England because you had a real chance to win this game. And if you're yep. if you're the Eagles, oh, take a breath. Like take a breath. You you Should've won yeah. a game on the road when they were honoring Tom Brady and the emotions were high. And you didn't know exactly what this New England offense would look like with the new offensive coordinator. And you know what? This Eagles team, of course, looked rusty. They didn't play any starters in the preseason. And even Sirianni said in the in the at post game that was probably a mistake. Uh, pretty rusty. But I think both yeah. teams, both teams, uh, to be expected. Um, I think New England. Uh, the way the AFC is shaking out, it, the New England. I think my like for New England increased a bit. I think my worry about Philly winning the division. No, I I, I still think they'll win their division and and they'll be absolutely in the discussion for a Super Bowl uh, from the NFC. Yeah, they'll be perfectly fine, and they did that show defense is that offense. You know, so and, and credit to New England. One of the worries was their offensive line only giving up two sacks on fifty four pass attempts against that yeah. defensive front. That's a huge. That's a huge reason why I feel better about New England today. Definitely, definitely. All right, the best game of the week in my view. Yeah, the Dolphins thirty six, Chargers thirty four. I tweeted this out in a week where many teams didn't. Both of these teams came to play, and that's they why did. it was such a good game. Like they they were both on point. Both offenses looked really good. Uh, you know, obviously there were some hiccups here and there. You never want to give up 36 points or 34 points on defense, but two up 466 yards passing looked amazing. Tyreek Hill had 215 yards and two touchdowns. Yeah, uh, you know, Miami with some timely sacks late in the fourth quarter to really you know, uh, take the wind out of the Chargers' sails. Meanwhile, the Chargers never got to Tua. No sacks for them. Um, 
But the one thing was, I, I think the Chargers can hold their head up, even though it was a tough loss. I mean, they won the turnover battle two to nothing and still yeah. lost. That doesn't happen very often. So if you're if you're the Chargers, I feel like, look, that was a really good team. We both, you know, exchanged punches. They just got the last one in. Um, and I know that's tough to say, but look, I mean, from what we saw the rest of the week, it could have been way worse. So if you're Los Angeles, I, you know, sigh, the sigh of relief um, that, you know, you didn't get clobbered. You were in there to the end. And for the Dolphins, huge win statement saying, we're not just a team that can run the football. We're going to air it out. And we could do that with Tua. If he stays healthy, I mean, this team is, is very tough. It, it's just kind of like what we saw to start the season last year. They started off hot. And we're doing really well. So if they can keep it up, they're going to be a very difficult team to beat. No question. Yeah, I think the. I mean, I think really the difference in this game was the fact that Justin Herbert was sacked three times. Tua wasn't sacked at all. Like they, when they needed to yeah, get to Tua, Bosa and Mac couldn't get there. And at the very end, Nick, Vic Fangio, who's all about Ben, don't break. Uh, the defensive coordinator from Miami, he drawed up, dialed up some pressure, and he got at Justin Herbert. Um, Again, I'm not concerned about either of these teams. This was a great game. I think that Chua really balling out early is is needed for a confidence boost like he did last year. I will say for both teams, though, as positive it was the Chua threw the ball and as positive it was that the Chargers really ran the ball and, you know, you know, 40 carries, 234 yards, like really committed to the run. Neither of these teams feel very much as of this morning still built for January football. And I'm just saying, I just want to say that to remind us all football in September is very different than football post Thanksgiving. And so Miami looks fun right now. I wouldn't be running in to put a future on Miami as a Super Bowl champion. I, I just say that they look very good. It was a fun game. I'm excited to see where both these teams, the direction they go. I think that Miami won the coaching battle, and I think they won uh, the the offensive line battle, and that was kind of the difference for this game. Yeah, I don't think either of these teams in the AFC are built to be powerhouses just yet. I mean, it's still Kansas City. Uh, you know, the Jets now certainly putting themselves in that position. But the Dolphins and Chargers are those two, like, elite wild card teams, in my view, like that, yeah. that can consistently be – uh, super good and always in that conversation throughout the year. The Rams beat the Seahawks 30. My to Rams, my Your Rams. Rams, baby. Your Rams. I bet that game. I made money on it. Money line there Rams. There you go. Yeah, no, the Seahawks looked uh, brutal. The offense was really out of sync uh, outside of the first quarter, really. They, they looked really bad. How about Puka Nakua with 10 receptions? I'm glad for you LA. said his name, not me. I was going to say the rookie <laughs> wide receiver. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Geno Smith, though, 16 to 26, 112 yards and a touchdown was just okay. But they like they couldn't get anything going. Seattle, uh, no run game again to speak of. And and the Rams really just destroyed time of possession. 39 minutes to Seattle's 20. That's the game right there. More than a quarter, a quarter more of of uh of time of possession there in the Rams favor. Yeah, that's gonna win you most games. So again, the, the I go back to so my second team that's in real trouble, Seattle. Seattle, I had missing the playoffs. And so again, my three teams I said going into the start of this that were in real trouble were three teams that missed the playoffs and looked really bad with some real issues week one. And the time of possession was absolutely it. I mean, Geno Smith threw the ball 26 times for only 112 yards. That's brutal. With those weapons too, and I know Smith and Jigba hasn't played yet, but uh, DK only three uh, three catches. Tyler Lockett was a non-factor, and then it's not even like they ran the ball really, really well. Only eighteen carries. Exactly. Offensively, they were just disjointed. And the Rams are such a young team, physical young team. Though you saw the physicality, and I said, "Listen, I'm not trying to take a ton of credit for the Rams." What did I say? If Matt Stafford's healthy, I think I like the Rams. Matt Stafford looked healthy. He looked good. They threw the ball 38 times, 334 yards, and uh, and I liked that they lean on the run game. They ran the ball 40 times, only 92 yards, but they committed to running the football. And they kept doing it. Exactly. And they kept doing it, and they would get enough to get first downs. That is uh, really exciting for Rams fans. They stole a game, 
And for the Seattle Seahawks, they should be really concerned because this feels like they caught lightning in a bottle with Geno last year, and now they're a talented team without that next-level quarterback, which may not be the worst thing in the world. Again, it was basically a one-year deal for Geno this year. Next sure. year is, is definitely like a backup type of salary. They can move on, and they have draft capital to do it. But uh, Seattle should be really concerned this morning. Yeah, yeah, that's a rough outing for Seattle and a really good showing for the Rams. I am not – I'm holding on that prediction of five wins for the Rams, but uh, but I'm a little a little more uh, wavering on it, I guess, after – after seeing that showing from Matt yeah. Stafford. And yeah, he, he definitely did look good in that opener. All right, finally, the Cowboys blank the Giants, the only shutout of the day. Cowboys 40, Giants 0. Daniel Jones sex seven times. Five fumbles for New York. They only lost one, but They're five terrible. fumbles. Terrible, terrible offensive showing from them. Uh, the defense of Dallas came to play. Two touchdowns, one on special teams, one on defense. Uh, scoring all over the place. Dak didn't even play that well, and he didn't have to. It was no, Tony Pollard playing to. well, and uh, yeah, just all around really good effort from the Cowboys. That's how you want to start a season. The Giants, meanwhile, already putting themselves into a hole, and it's again, it's like the Steelers, like the Bears. Total confidence, uh, you know, knock down there. You're going to need to try and rebound quickly to to build some sort of semblance of of, of confidence and a big dose of humility for sure. Yeah, the Giants are my third and final team in real trouble. I mean, you don't lose 40 nothing at home on Sunday Night Football and not be in real trouble. And again, I didn't pick them to make the playoffs. You didn't pick them to make the playoffs either, did you? No, I picked them fourth in the division, actually. But as, so. a, team that, as a team that was a playoff team last year with a lot of people had that kind of like, oh, they could be in that hunt for it. I mean, this is a gigantic yeah. loss because it's one of those, you can easily say, oh, burn the tape, whatever, but that's the kind of effort you put out on national TV against a divisional rival at home after paying your quarterback a contract that widely was panned. They're in real trouble. They're in real trouble. And I'll say this about Dallas. I also picked Dallas to miss the playoffs, right? Yes. Didn't uh, And so I am, I am, a little nervous about that prediction, but I'm I'm gonna hope and pray that it was more. This is just that's how bad the Giants were, and that Dallas has owned the Giants like the Packers have owned the Bears of over, over the Dak Prescott era, and yeah. just kind of write it off. And we'll see. Depending on how the Jets look tonight, they have the Jets and Cowboys uh, next uh, next week on primetime Sunday Night Football. That'll be a fun one. That should be a good one for sure. Yeah. No, I I. I agree that the Cowboys, uh, you know, did look good, but it was mainly the defense that looked great. I that that's the one thing I would say is their offense still didn't look very good, and so when they play some of these elite defenses throughout yeah. the year, they may very well get exposed. Final thoughts on Monday Night Football here: Bills at the Jets. We get to see Aaron Rodgers finally in a Jet uniform in regular season football under the lights. The line at Caesar's Sportsbook has Buffalo minus one and a half. What are your uh, initial thoughts on this matchup? Well, I'm taking Buffalo to win. I'm taking Buffalo um, to have a really nice night. I think that New York will come out. I think it'll be really tight in the first half. I could see this game being 17-10 New York Jets at, at half, and Aaron looks really good, maybe throws two touchdowns early. But I think overall, I think addition by subtraction for the Buffalo Bills. Leslie Frazier being out as the defensive coordinator, Actually, I think that's a good thing. He's one of those old school guys that I think in the modern NFL, I think you're seeing aggressive, more aggressive Buffalo defense, a little bit more pressure being put on. They're going to get after the passer. That the weakness of the Jets offense is that offensive line. I, I think the Bills will take advantage of it. I think Aaron will look good. My heart as a Bears fan cannot take the Packers winning and looking good and Aaron Rodgers yeah. winning and looking good. So I'm all in on the Bills. Yeah, it's a bad double dip. Uh, I'm going to take the Jets to win this one, though. I would not just cover, but money line. Uh, I think they'll win this All game. Right. I think it'll be close. I, I hope it'll be close as well. Treat us. I think both, game. but maybe Allen, a little less lower scoring than thought. Maybe 24 I, 20 somewhere in there. I have a uh, the only bet I have in this game is a parlay. Both Allen and Aaron to throw over one and a half touchdowns parlayed together. I, I think mean, they're. I think certainly could happen. Either. I think they're both going to throw throw the rock around a little bit and want to want to show out. I think they both will have chances to. I think I think they'll both throw for at least two touchdowns. All right, those are our thoughts on Monday Night Football and the week that we just saw from Week One of the NFL. Looking forward, we're back. Ahead.
to week two. We are back officially here on the Football Lounge with Mark and Dan for the 2023 NFL season. Hope you all enjoyed it. Please give us a like, subscribe, check us out on Facebook, Twitter, all of those good places are Axe, whatever, Instagram, all of those uh, places, and, uh, and, and be sure to tune in every week for our recaps. But that'll do it for us here from week one. We'll see you next time. For frequency's sake, has you covered on all things sports. From the squared circle to the hardwood and the gridiron to the speedway, we've got something for everyone. Walk down the aisle with the boys from Cards Subject to Change every Sunday as they take a deep dive into everything pro wrestling. Need your gambling fix? We've got you there. Enter Pit Row with Rod Villagomez and Fast Money as we win the checkered flag with NASCAR, Xfinity, and truck race winners and props. Football more your style? Explore the waters of NFL DFS with DFS Deep Dive with Brian Craighead and Jordan Kernan each week. More into the science portion of the game? We've got a double dose of action there. The Professor John Bush and Dennis Michelson take you into their science lab and dissect your week in the data lab. Want an analytical take? Nick Gurl and the team at Gridiron AI come to you each week with The Lab. Need to know who to start last minute? The network's flagship show, for fantasy's sake, is here in a pinch. The fellows come to you live every football Sunday from 10 to 1130 Central with the week's best DFS, gambling, and lineup advice. And wrap up your Sundays with Joe Winkle and Nick Brinks as they come to you live with educated ignorance looking at all the day's action. Can't get enough of Joe? He comes to you three times a week. Not enough football on Sunday? Not a problem. Kick your feet up at lunch on Monday and slip on into the football lounge with Mark and Dan while they look at the week that was in news, notes, and more.